so, so this is definitively one of those I have prepared absolutely nothing situations. So I am counting on you guys to provide interesting feedback, suggestions about what we should do. The, the basic thing that I want to do is to do some live coding with Wolfram Language. And uh, the, um, uh, the kind of, I should give kind of the intro. You know, I've been building what's now the Wolfram Language for basically about 30 years. And my kind of idea has been from the beginning to have a system where we have a language where we've built as much as possible into the language. So as much knowledge about computation, about the world, and so on as possible, and where we've automated as much as possible. So kind of the idea is, if you have an idea, the language should provide you as direct as possible a way to uh, represent that idea, and then to get that idea actually executed as code. So in terms of using the language, um, you can, at this hackathon, um, you can, well, you can use it in several different ways. In the world at large, if you just go to the Wolfram.com website, and you press the button that says development platform, you will get into a free, you don't even have to log in, uh, cloud version of everything that I'm going to show you here today. I'll actually use the desktop version of our development environment because it's a little bit smoother and faster because it doesn't have to do a bunch of web transactions to do things. Um, at this hackathon, you can, you can also download the Wolfram desktop that allows you to do that too. Um, in terms of... Uh, the, um, what, one of the things that's been interesting to us recently with Wolfram Language is we've reached the point where we've sort of automated enough of what has to be done that kind of the, the, the fancy R&D folk who've used Wolfram Language and Mathematica for many years in the past sort of don't have much advantage over the kids who've never done programming before in terms of actually getting programs built. And so one of the things we've, we've done a lot of recently is uh, building things for programming education and uh, there's a thing called Programming Lab. So this is the, I, it doesn't look like there are very many people who are, who are in the never programmed before category. I, I never, you never know what to expect, but um, th this looks like a definitely uh, a hardened programmer crowd here. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, if there are people here who are in the never programmed before category, uh, you might like this Wolfram Programming Lab, um, which, uh, uh, which kind of starts from nothing and gets to uh, fairly sophisticated programming kinds of things, and I was going to show you. So one of the um, one of the things that I did recently is to write a, a book that you can find free online, and you can also find a physical copy, which I was about to hold up here, but I realised I don't have one. But there's one over at that table over there. This is an introductory book about Wolfram language for people who haven't programmed before. Although somewhat for my, to my surprise, it also seems to have been being read by very sophisticated people. Um, and it's a quick read uh, for, uh, as an introduction to language. Okay, well, so let's actually do some things. Let me, let me start off just giving you a very quick sort of uh, run through of sort of things that the Wolfram language does. And then you could see I was just starting to pull in some, some NASA related data here, but I didn't actually, didn't actually pull it in yet. But let's, let's, um, uh, let's start off with some basics here. So the basic form of interaction with Wolfram language that is most convenient for developing things is you type in a piece of code, it types back the result of evaluating that code. So, you know, I could type in some computation here, and I'll get back the result of the computation. I could say, you know, make me a, uh, you know, make me a 3D plot of, um, you know, some, I don't know what, some, some funny thing here. Um, and uh, I'll get my 3D plot, and I could say, once I have this plot, I could export it in all kinds of forms. I could do all kinds of things with it. There's the plot. Let me give it a parameter here. Let's say I put a parameter A there. I can make a user interface here. Um, and I'll show you how to do, take all these things that I'm doing and deploy them on the web and so on, um, if that's what you want to do. But here I'm just making a manipulate where I can uh, just vary that parameter and um, uh, get the result. Um, and this is, uh, this is kind of standard Wolfram language stuff. So kind of the, the idea of Wolfram language is be able to deal with sort of any kind of data. So a typical type of thing we might do is let's pick up an image here. Let's say we get the current image. Let's get another current image. Okay, there's a current image. Um, and uh, now we can take that image and start doing some kind of image processing. So let's say we, we want to edge detect that image. Okay, there's the result of edge detecting that image. Um, if we wanted to, we could dynamically, you know, edge detect our current image. Um, and uh, let's, let's go ahead and do that. And then we get that thing working in real time. 
Uh, we could also take, do something where we take, um, uh, I mean, this is a, um, so we, we can do all sorts of image processing. We'll probably do a bunch of that with interesting astronomical data and so on in, in a little while here. But I just want to kind of run through a few basic things we can do here. Um, we can deal with, um, I don't know, let's say we want to deal with graphs. We could say make a random graph, um, 100 nodes, 200 edges, there's the graph. We can go and um, do something like make a, a, a plot of uh, communities in that graph, let's say. Um, we, we can do that from, from data, whatever else we want to do. We could, uh, let's see, what else, what other kinds of things can we do? We might take, um, well, let, let's, let's start looking at some kind of real world data. So an important feature of the language is that it knows stuff about the real world. So for example, let's say I type in New York City. Okay, New York City is just an entity in this language. The thing I should explain about the language is that it's a symbolic language. So when I type in X, in most languages it would say, what is X? I don't know what X is, I'm confused, it's an error. In Wolfram language, X is just stands for X. Um, so you can do things, you know, I could say, perfectly well say, you know, just nest uh, the function f symbolically, uh, starting with x. I could as well here, I could take, uh, let's, let's do this, let's take, um, let's take that picture there, and I could say something like, um, let's take that, let's nest it. Okay, there's the nested f of that picture. Um, perhaps a more interesting thing, why don't I take, uh, why don't I do the edge detection? Um, so this will now make nested edge detection of that picture. So this is essentially iterating edge detection on that picture. Um, for example, let, let me just, let's combine some things together here just for fun. Let's, let's say we want to just take, um, let's take the n-way nested edge detection of this picture and let's make a manipulate out of those uh, where we're saying let's manipulate that, so let's say n from 1 to 20 in steps of 1 or something. So now we should get a control there and as we move this control, I've never actually tried doing this before, but we should get, yeah, there we go. We get this kind of um, successive uh, uh, nesting of, of those kinds of things. Actually, I have another idea, something we can do with this. Let, let's get those, um, let's take those things and let's take, um, let's take the nested versions of that um, and uh, let's take that, let's say it's 10 times nested here. Okay, let's do this. And actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to um, uh, image resize this image so that I make a lower resolution version of this image. So let's make a, a 200 by 200 version, uh, pixel version of that image. Okay, so there we have that. Now, my idea is, which may or may not work, let's try making an image 3D out of this. Let's see what that does. Oh, that's bad. Okay, that means should be an array of rank with machine size numbers. Oh, consistent color space. Okay, so what I could do here, I could say image conform, or I could just be lazy and I could drop the first of these images. Let's, let's just drop, let's see that was line two, so let's just drop the first of those images, and now I could, hopefully I can say image 3D of that percent means the current thing. There we go, that's cool. Okay, so there we have a, a, um, a 3D image that's made from the stack of successive uh, uh, nestings of that, um, of that 2D image. And we can go ahead and do image processing on that 3D image if we wanted to um, as well. But, but okay, but I digress. We were, we were talking about, um, we were looking at New York City, for example. So we should be able to, where is this? Okay, let's, um, let's start looking, well, let's see, where does it think we are? Okay, that's a geoposition. Let's find out, let's actually geo-identify uh, let's say city, um, and then let's say here, and that will tell us, um, that will hopefully tell us uh, which city, oh, that's, a, that's well, I don't know where that position is, let's find out where that position is. Let's say uh, geographics, let's make a disk, let's make a 10 mile diameter disk around where we are right now. Um, so let's say 10 miles here, um, and let's see where it thinks, I mean this is based on very interesting. Okay, this is where it thinks, based on the GOIP of this computer, this is where it thinks this computer is right now. So I think we have to, let, let's see, let's just find out where, where on earth it is. I, I don't know, the, the, I have no idea. Oh, wow, that's exciting. Oh, it's, okay, it's in Kansas, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, so that's probably, I bet that that position is actually the center of the US. So let's find out. Um, so let us find out what's the geographic center uh, let's see what happens if I do this. I think that will probably... Oh, no, that doesn't work. Okay, let's try this. Um, I'll tell you what. Actually, the easy way to do this, the cheap way to do this, is to say center of the U.S. Um, and, okay, there's the center coordinates of the U.S., and it's 38 minus 97. So it looks like we are 
uh, wherever it thinks we are based on this computer, it's really close to the center of the US. So let's, let's see what, um, let's see if we can actually work out. Let's take the, the center of the US according to this. Okay, there's here. Let's do the, let's just find out the, um, uh, the geo distance between here and the center of the US. Okay. Okay, so, so it thinks right now, for whatever crazy reason, it thinks this computer is 48 miles from the, from the geographic center of the US. Who knows why? Um, in any case, what I, so I, actually, I've already started showing you some of the kinds of things that we can do. Let's say we, we take New York City and we could say, you know, something like, what's the population of New York City? Um, and uh, this is, this is uh, data that we've curated and so on, it has that kind of information. So we can, let, let's try doing something a little bit more astronomical. Let's say we take um, planets, do this for exoplanets or all kinds of other things as well, but let's just take planets and let's say, um, let's just get a list of uh, planets. Okay, there's a list of planets. So now let's say we want to get, um, uh, let's say we want to say the value of the mass for each of those planets, okay? So there's the masses of all the planets. Um, now we could take, for example, I don't know, what would we want to do there? We could take, well, we could just take the total of all those masses Actually, we could take the total of all those masses and divide it by the mass of the sun. I don't know what this, um, let's see what we get there. Uh, okay, so the mass is, so that just tells us what fraction of the mass of the solar system is in planets versus, well, the sum of the mass of the planets divided by the sun. So let, let's try doing something else here. Let's, let's take those, um, uh, those the, let's take the planets there um, and let's go ahead, oh, what are they, line 16, and let's go ahead and get images of all those planets. And so one thing we might do is make some kind of um, uh, image collage where we say, let's make a, a, a collage where the size of each planet is proportional to its mass. So that's easy to do. We just say image collage of line 17, arrow line 20 there, and we should be able to get a, a plot that shows the, the, uh, the planets in, um, uh, uh, with sizes proportional to their, their, their mass. Um, so we can go ahead and do what, what, we can do all kinds of things here. Maybe we could take um, let's do let's do something different. Let's do something to do with uh, let's say satellites. So we could say, for example, let's take a, something like the ISS. So we can probably say uh, let's try finding see what happens if we say um, uh, let's try this. Uh, let's see if this works. I'm not sure if this will work. Let's see. So we're asking it to work out, yeah, it did, okay. So that's asking it to work out the geoposition of the ISS. So that will give us the lat long and then the vertical, whoops, that was a bad idea. Um, the, uh, the vertical um, uh, position of the ISS. So actually what we could now say is let's say geo-visible region and then this position of the ISS here. So let's take the geoposition of the ISS and then we can say, let's make a map where we so show on geographics, oops, we show on geo, geo, what am I typing? Geographics, um, I show the, um, uh, the geo visible region of the ISS. So that's showing now uh, a circle that shows what, what points on the Earth are visible to the ISS right now. Um, and uh, uh, maybe I can show this, Let, let's just do this for, let's just show it for a, um, uh, let's go ahead and show this for geo range. Why am I typing that suddenly? Geo range all. So that will now show us where the ISS is on the Earth. If I wanted to, I could show a different map projection. So I could say something like geo projection, arrow. I don't know. Anybody got a favorite? We've got hundreds of these map projections. Let's do Lambert Azimuthal, for example. Um, so there's, there's where, the, where the ISS is right now, or was when I typed in that. Um, uh, that line, actually it might be fun to see what the, let's just do this, let's type that same input again and let's see whether it's different. And let's see, the, okay, so that's, okay, so that's now the, the new, no, that looks like it's the same position, it obviously got itself cached. Um, let's see, let's see how we would solve that problem. Uh, that's an interesting problem, that might have, it might have cached the position, thinking that geo positions, I think that's a bug. I think it cached the position because it thinks things don't move in geoposition um, and it doesn't know about satellites. Okay, that's good. Um, that's, uh, uh, um, well, I'm sure we can ask it the actual uh, position at a particular time. Um, 
but let's let's not worry about that right now. Let's let's instead try. What can we do? We could try getting some other satellites. If somebody has some favorite satellites, we could probably try try getting some of those. We might say random entity, uh, say satellite here. Let's just take 20 random satellites. Um, okay, there they are. I don't know what these are, but let's see whether they're. Let's try taking um, the geo positions of those 20 random satellites. Let's see what um, many unable to obtain location information for Sputnik 25. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's, uh, uh, I doubt Sputnik 25 is, is, is among us anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, well, so, oh, look at this. Cosmos, yeah, I mean, Luna 11 is probably not some. Um, actually, let's find, out, let's find out whether we actually do have interesting properties of something like Luna 11. Let's see whether we have, um, we might have the position. Let's see whether what happens if I say geoposition of, um, of Luna 11, um, I, don't, I don't know what Luna 11 was. Maybe somebody here knows what it was. Um, no, sorry, it doesn't know where it is. But let, let's say, I mean, if we, if we want to take something like you know Apollo 11 landing site, um, let's see what it does with that. So that should give us a okay. So that gives us a geo position. But now that geo position is not on the Earth, but on the Moon. And if we say geographics of that geo range to all. It should, if everything's working correctly, be a plot. Yeah, that's a good sign. Okay, that's a plot. Actually, what I should have done here is I should have said geo list plot, and that would plot this. Let, let's do this. Let's take, um, uh, let's say, uh, Apollo moon landings, um, and that should be, let's see what those are. Let's try an entity list of those. Okay, so those are, the, those are the various Apollos that landed on the moon. So now let's go ahead and say there seems to be a property here, lunar landing location. So, oops, let's, um, let's say, uh, okay, hold on. Um, that, I want to take, uh, yeah, okay, so let's do this. Let's say, let's get the, um, uh, let us go ahead and say, I want the um, entity value of that with uh, line 36 with a lunar landing location. Um, let's see what happens here. Oops, I obviously asked for the wrong thing. Okay, hold on. When in doubt, I could always look at the documentation, but let's, um, let's avoid that for a second. Let's say we want to do, um, let's just say we just look for properties of this. Well, actually, I'll tell you what, I could just say lunar, uh, lunar landing date. Okay, landing launch site landing position. There we go, that's what it is. Okay, so what I want to do is say, um, uh, say for this, for line 36, I want to get the positions on the moon where all of those things landed. And now I could say, for example, I could say something like um, geo list plot of those. Um, and uh, oops, I need to say invalid map style, no street, no street map labels for the moon. Um, <laughs> So I have to um, I have to tell it um, geo range arrow moon, and what I should be able to get here. Let's do this. Let's say um, I, I want to ask it to show me that. Um, okay. So what this should be doing? No, that's foolish. Okay. Let's see. I think I need to do, what do I need to do? Geo background arrow. Let's try that. Okay, that wasn't very exciting. That was showing no background. That was showing the positions of the lunar landing sites, but without a background image of the moon. Let's see what happens if I just say automatic. Oh, there we go. Okay, so those are the positions, those are the landing sites on the moon. And one thing we could work out just for fun, I'm now, I'm, I'm digressing here, but I think this is, I'm, I'm having fun at least. So we could get, uh, for example, I could get a traveling salesman tour going if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to like visit all of the lunar landing sites. So let's, let's try, um, uh, let's say this is, okay, so that's line, uh, okay, so sites, landing sites is line 39 here. And now I could say find shortest tour of line 39. And so that should give me, so okay, so 2,500 miles, you can make a tour of all the lunar landing sites. So now what I should be able to do is take those 
and I should be able to take those and I should be able to say this. I'm going to reorder them this way. I'm going to say, uh, uh, let's see, um, joined to true. Uh, and maybe I want to say, um, let's, let's make it uh, geo range all, which should show the whole moon. Um, and okay, there we go. So that's the, that's the traveling salesman tour of uh, all the landing sites for, for the Apollo missions. I think it's cool we could do this stuff this evening. <laughs> All right, well, let's try doing, um, I, I want to show one more thing and then we're going to dive into actual NASA data. Uh, the thing I wanted to show, I mean, sort of the idea of orphan language, as I was explaining, is sort of automate as much as possible. So there are many different sort of kinds of, auto, kinds of things that have been automated, whether it's visualization techniques or image processing or computational geometry, uh, all sorts of other things like that. Uh, or all of these kinds of things with data. But an important area of automation these days is machine learning. And we've got uh, pretty good ways of doing uh, things like um, uh, uh, automated classification and things like this. Actually, for example, let me show you an interesting case here. So if I say image identify, here, yeah, let, me, let me see if I can do something here. Let me see if this works. This may not work from here. But if I say um, web image search, let's just try, let's try something silly. Well, all right, let's try something silly to begin with. Um, can't resolve host name, that's a bad sign. Um, okay, it might have worked. Uh, okay, so let's say, uh, let's see, I want to call it two. Okay, so this purports to be weird. Okay, uh, this is actually gonna be a bad example. So let me, let me first pick a better example. Let's pick a, um, uh, I don't know, let's pick a, let, let's pick a type of animal, okay? Let's make it simple. And you got a, but I got a favorite kind of animal. Okay, there's an otter. Um, so, so these are just, I mean, if, if we, you know, in Wolfram language, we, we will certainly know about otters. So we can just say an otter, okay, there's a type of thing. We could say, give me an image of the otter. Okay, there's a, there's a sort of standard image of an otter. Um, but here I just picked otters off the web. So I'm just saying, here's a bunch of otters on the web. And now we've got an image identification function which can take one of those pictures of an otter here and we could say image identify uh, and give it that picture and now it will say it's an otter, okay, a certain type of otter. Um, now I could, I could, for example, let's, let's just take that function image identify, this was um, line 53 and I could just say image identify, um, uh, let's say map that over line 53. So what this is now going to do is it's going to, going to tell me for each of those pictures what it thinks it is. And maybe I could t tell it to make, uh, it wasn't very exciting here, but I could make a, a, that wasn't a very exciting word cloud, but I could make a word cloud of, of what it says it is. Let's say just for fun, we'll just try it because it'll, it's kind of uh, going to uh, kill the thing. I wonder what happens if I say that. Will that work? No, that doesn't work. Um, okay, so this is, um, so this is going to give me pictures of things that are supposed to be Martians. Uh, let's let's do. Um, I think it's mostly the movie. Uh, yeah, mostly the movie. That's it, it, um, so. Let's let's just see what happens. It will probably do stupid things here. But let's tell it to image identify those. Um, uh, okay. Person vertebrate vertebrate. Okay, that's not so bad. Let's actually just for just for the hell of it. Let's actually try making this in such a way that we can see what it's what it's doing. So let's make a column where the top of the column is, the, so this hash thing is, this is making a pure function lambda expression. This hash thing represents the, the thing that's going in. So let's say line 59 there. So this is now going to make something where everything is going to be labeled with, okay, person, good, vertebrate, okay. Not so bad, not so bad. It's not, not obviously wrong. Um, person, 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 great, 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 and hill, okay. Not so bad. Actually, what's kind of interesting to see, let's take that one, for instance, and let's just see, let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's say we say image identify of this in all categories, and let's go, um, let's show the first 10 of them, and let's show probabilities. I think I got this right. Let's see whether that works. Um, so what this should do, yeah, there we go. So that's showing us the probabilities. Okay, so there's a 0.1% there's a probability that it's a rock squirrel. Which is, is a little bit 
bit obscure, but uh, um, you know, that's what uh, you know. It has to it has to make a trade off between uh, specificity and certainty. You know, it's pretty sure it's a vertebrate. It's a little less sure it's a mammal. It thinks it might might be a carnivorous mammal, um, and uh, you know, it's giving those things with certain certain probabilities. Actually, you could probably make a more interesting word cloud. This would be more more fun. Let's take those. Uh, things on line 62, there's the word cloud of what it thought that picture might be. Actually, why don't we just, just for fun, let's let it go all the way down. Let's say um, all here, and it'll probably generate a huge long list. Maybe it'll to be too long a list, let's see. Oh, come on, that was maybe a mistake. I was gonna get it to generate the list of all possible things it could imagine that this picture might be, which may, might be a super long list. I think it is a super long list, and I think this is a bad idea. Okay, never mind that. Let's, let's get it to at least show us like 30 of those things. Okay, there we go. So now let's make a word cloud out of those things just for fun. Um, so, okay, so there, there's the, uh, you know, the even, you know, the, the meerkat is down there, and the eared seal is down there at smaller, smaller values. Okay. So that's a little bit about what Wolfram language can do. So let's let's do some let's do something with some NASA data. So I had um, I had just started looking at the catalog of NASA data. Um, the um, uh, let me um, try and pull up what I had. And I was just starting at the very beginning there, somewhere up here. I was just starting. I had just downloaded a. Um, uh, let me let me let me. I'll tell you what. Let me actually get more organized because I. This, we have this very nice concept of notebooks, and this document that I have here is a notebook, so let me actually make a section heading, and if I wasn't rushing so much, I would have been doing this all the way along. Meteorite data, so this was data about, um, actually, you know, we've got initial setup here. This is the way I actually like to work, is put in all these notebook elements, and I could, you know, close up that section if I want to, um, and, uh, but anyway, I've got meteorite data here, so I've just, been putting something in Dropbox here. Let's see what I have there. Okay, great. Let me go ahead and import the data associated with the satellite landings uh, data set. And now let's, um, I mean, meteorite landings is what I'm talking about. And now I think, so this is now, you know, now we're dealing with a jungle, so to speak, out there because this is just some random data set that I'm seeing. So there's, there's obviously some character encoding there, problem there, but let's not worry about it. Let's say, if I say the second element of this data set, um, we should get, okay, we'll get a bunch of things there. All right, so let's go ahead and, um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. Before I do this, before I launch into this, I've got another important thing I should show you, which is when you build something in this IDE interactively, how do you deploy this on the web, okay? So uh, let's, let's, let's show a little bit about how you do web deployment. So the way you do it is it's another kind of way of using symbolic things, so let's say, we have a, um, what can we do? Well, let's, let's do just the animal example here. So let's say we have a, um, we're going to make a form. It's going to have a field. The field is going to be called animal. What's expected in that field is the natural language input for an animal, okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to take that animal and we're going to say, I want an image of that animal. And let's uh, say, for example, we want to magnify that image. Um, just because it might be too small otherwise. And let's say we do that. Let's say we're going to put it out on the web as a PNG. And now let me go ahead and let's say cloud deploy that. And let's say I want to make it so that this is something that's just available to the whole world. So I want to make this a public cloud deployment. Okay, so I'm going to take this and now I'll get a, an object in our cloud. I can go to that object and I can type, for example, you know, meerkat or something in here. And this is now a, a smart field which understands natural language using the same technology stack that we use for from Alpha. And now I get a picture of a meerkat there. So now let's say I want to go back. I want to change my meerkat. I want to make it a, um, a picture. Let's, let's just imagine that I want to do both the thing and the edge detection of the thing next to each other, OK? So just for something, something random to do here. Um, so let's do that. So I just changed that code. Now I redeploy that API. And now let's put in a, um, a tiger, for example, here. And now what we should get is the tiger and the edge detection of the tiger, okay? So we just made, so now this, this thing that I just made, this little app that I just made, will also show up on the mobile, uh, the Wolfram Cloud mobile app. So it will be a little mobile app on Android. You can have it be a standalone uh, APK file that you produce. It will be a standalone app that just is that particular form. 
Now I could, for example, I could go ahead and I could add something back to this form. I could say, for example, here, I could put in some number, let's say I could say, um, you know, depth or something here, and I could say that's an integer. Um, now I could say let's, let's edge detect by that depth. Um, and now I'll have a, a different, um, a different form there which has a second field which asks for the depth and so on. And I can make arbitrarily complicated forms. I can make all kinds of different controls here. I could make something, you know, I could make the depth be a slider, all kinds of other things like that. Now I can also take this thing and instead of making it be a, uh, a form like this, I can make it into an API. And so now this is a, this is a web API that I just created. That particular web API is just going to give an error because I didn't give it the parameters. So I could say question mark animal equals lion ampersand depth equals uh, you know eight or something. And now when I run that API, I'll get oops, I made a mistake here. But but uh, oh maybe I didn't. I'm not sure what I did wrong here. But but anyway, the the um, uh, the idea is that I'm I'm going into that. I'm calling this API from this uh, from the web here. And now, um, uh, let's see. Okay. Oh, I know what I did wrong. Okay. In any case, the, the, um, uh, if I wanted to, I could turn this, this API, I could say, give me embed code to embed that API in a Java program, for example. And so now this will give me, this will generate the code that I need to call that API in our cloud uh, from, from a Java program, and that's, that's available for most common uh, programming languages and so on. So, so that's some, some idea about how you can uh, deploy things to the cloud. You can also deploy interactive things, so I could take, I don't know, I think I had something way up here, um, where I had an interactive, uh, let's, let's take this thing here on line eight. Let's just deploy, let's just cloud deploy that interactive manipulate. So now we can say cloud deploy of this, um, and uh, can take that, and this should, oh, I should have made it public. Let me just make it public here. Um, let's, uh, let's say permissions to public. Um, okay, so now this will deploy that, that thing, um, that interactive thing. I hope it will deploy that interactive thing. Wake up, wake up. There we go. Okay, so it's deployed that interactive thing to the cloud, um, and uh, it won't be as zippy as it was on the desktop, um, but we can still go ahead and, um, and do things with this in the cloud. Okay? So that was, and you can embed this, this interactive thing in, in whatever uh, web, uh, website or whatever else you want. Okay, all right, let's get down to business here. Let's, let's do something with some NASA data. That was what I kind of intended to do here. Okay, where are we? Um, oops, the, okay, so I have this meteorite data. Okay, so I just imported the meteorite data and this is, the, this is the general form of that data. It's kind of a mess. Um, but let's, uh, okay, this was probably a date here. Okay, let, let me start showing you what we would do to do something with this data, okay? All right, so let's, let's take, um, so it looks like we've got um, uh, the, the top of the, the first element in the data is a header, and then there's a bunch of, um, bunch of kind of structured data underneath it. So I think what we probably want to do, he says, is to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this, is I want to thread that, that, that. Let's find out how much data there is here. Let's just see what I can. I'm going to do something kind of in a stupid way. Okay, there's 45,000 lines of data here. Hmm, 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 hmm. Do I really want to do it this way? Uh, let's see what happens if I just say, I'm just going to try this out for, let's just see, I'm going to test something out to see whether I know what I'm talking about here. Um, so I'm going to take the first two lines of data from that file. And I am going to, no, that didn't work the way I would like it to work, but this will, I think. So what this is going to do is it's going to make this into what's called an association, which is a, a associative array. Okay, so now what this is going to do, so what I want to do here is I want to say, um, take this for all the data in that thing, and I'll say, um, uh, let's see, data set equals, and now I'm going to live really dangerously. I'm going to do it all in one go um, and say rest of mData and came back quickly. That's a good sign. Let's see what happens if I display it. Okay, that's cool. Okay, so this is a data set that is that data that we just got from, from that file. Okay, so let's first of all, let's just, let's just for fun, let's find out. Let's look at the mass field. 
Okay, so that's, what does it say? It's mass G, so let's say data set, and then let's say all, comma, and then mass of G. Okay, so that will give us 45,000 mass values. So let's go ahead and, and just make a histogram. We should be able to just make a histogram of those mass values. Um, and something funky is happening here. Let's see. I'm suspicious here. Okay, let's stop that. Let's just get the um, let's just get that list of mass values. I am suspicious that there's something wild and woolly down there. Well, maybe not. Okay, let's just try this. Um, I wonder why that's taking anything more than a, a microsecond to do. There must be something weird happening here. Um, let's let's look at the following. Um, it's uh, uh, okay. There we go. Okay, so there's the histogram of masses of, um, uh, of meteorites that are in this database. Uh, maybe it would be more interesting if we do showed, let, let's see, what would be a better example here? Maybe we should show the log, um, some kind of log histogram. Well, for that, I have to go look at documentation because I can't remember how to do that. Um, I think, let's see, there are many different ways to do this. Um, we would want to do, uh, okay, this is, um, uh, this is, Right, specifications, okay. So we want to say, actually one thing we might want to do is to take the log of those, um, let's do this, let's, let's take the logarithm of the, um, uh, of, of the things, um, okay, let's do this. Let's say, okay, so let's call this masses, and let's take, let's call that log masses. Um, is log to the base 10, let's say, of um, the things on line 86. Um, okay, so let's do this. And now let's just see what happens. Let's just look at the histogram of these. I'm just really surprised that, um, actually, I have a better idea here. Let's do that. Um, let, let's, uh, oh, masses. Okay. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Okay, so that's the distribution of the logarithm of the mass of the meteorite. Okay? Okay, so next idea. Let's take that distribution, log masses, and let's say we have a nice little machine learning function that's called find distribution. Um, and let's say, I don't know what it's going to do, but let's see what happens here. Let's say we want to get, let's do this. It does not have the data, okay. That was bad. All right, let's look at this log masses thing. Um, what does it look like? Those look like they're all numbers. That's a bit of a surprise here. Oh, I know what the problem is. I know what the problem is. Um, oh, very odd. Okay, well, let's just check. Um, let us go select in line 92, not number Q, hash. Um, so that's going to find all things, oh, oh, I see, there are a bunch of elements there that weren't numbers, okay? So what we want to do from this log masses thing, we'll say log masses is select log masses, uh, comma, number Q, and that will then just select the ones that are numbers, okay? So now I can say, given that, I should be able to say uh, this. Okay, so now this is crunching, trying to find out what it thinks the best distribution that fits. Okay, so it thinks it's a mixture of a normal distribution and a log normal distribution. So remember, this is, let, let's look at the histogram of the actual logarithm of the masses of the meteorites. There it is. And so now let's compare that with, let's see, that went up to about six. Let's compare that with a plot of the PDF uh, of the things on line 96, which were those, well, let's just, yeah, the things on line 96 as a function of x from zero to six. And so now this will be, that's the, that's its guess. That distribution, that's a plot of the distribution that it got. So we should be able to just say, show line 97, see if this works, and line 96. I'm not sure if this is going to work, but we can try it. No, it won't let us do that. Oops, what did I want to do? 98, sorry. Um, ah, the problem is that the scale is way different because this is in counts rather than probabilities. So what we want to do instead is we want to say for our histogram, we want to say histogram of log masses, um, comma, and I think we just have to say probabilities here. Um, not certain if this is right, but um, uh, let's see if that's right. No, okay. Oh, how many bins to use? Okay, let's just say automatic set of bins, and let's see. That's not what it likes, okay. 
There we go. Okay, so now this is showing the probabilities for meteorite sizes rather than the total counts for meteorite sizes. So there's a good chance then that if we say show this together with line 98, that we should get, yeah, there we go. Okay, so it was a lousy fit, but that was, that was its best fit of a distribution uh, for the distribution that it thought was the, you know, we were sort of doing automated science here, trying to find what would be the scientific law that gives the distribution of meteorite sizes. Well, let's try, okay, let's try something else from this data. Let's say we get, where was our data set? We, we'll, we'll go down here. Okay, here's the data set. Let's try, um, let's try the year. So it seems to have a field here for the year when they, well, let's try, we've got rect lat, let, rect long. So let's try, let's try that. So lat long, rect lat, rect long. So we could say data set, um, we could say get from the data set all things with uh, rect lat, comma, rect long. Let's see if this works. Um, let's actually just try, just before I do everything, let's try doing this. Um, no, that didn't work. Okay, let's see. Um, ah, no, that's the problem. That's the problem. Um, no? All right, let me see. Now I have to think a little bit more. Let's try, try taking a look. Okay, so that was the latitude there. So let's try taking from the data set, we want all the elements, and we want to say the key is. What did I do? Did I spell it wrong? Oh, oh, oh. oh. Well, so I should listen to what the error messages say. Okay, so there they go. So now if we wanted to, let's, let's, um, let's say normal of that, and let's, make, let's select just numbers in there, um, and let's just, so the first thing we can do here is that's again, let's make a histogram of what the um, latitudes at which the meteorites are falling. That's kind of interesting. So the latitudes, so meteorites tend to fall, where do the meteorites tend to fall? At plus 50 and minus 100. Well, let, let's, try, let's try doing the same thing. Um, let's just, for fun, let's try doing the same thing for longitude. So that means, where is that? That's, that's at the poles, or where is that? Well, let's find out. Okay, so let's try taking this at longitudes also, and let's do the exact same thing for longitudes. So let's do this. Um, let's do that for longitude. Um, and there we go, that, let's do this. Okay, so this is now the longitudes at which the meteorites are tending to fall. Um, and uh, perhaps what we can do, let, let's take both latitudes and longitudes and do the obvious thing. Let's take, um, let's see, what we want to do here is uh, longitude and uh, let's see, lat, latitude, longitude. So lat is longitude, and let's say latitude there, and let's go ahead and transpose that so that we get a pair of um, those, and let's just see what happens if we just say geolist plot. Um, so this is what this should be doing. Let's see if it works. Uh, horrifying. Um, okay. Now let's take it apart. Let's actually debug this. Okay, so what we did was we asked for the latitude. Well, let's first of all, let's see whether I was actually getting the right kind of thing here. So this is, that's the longitudes. Ah, I know what the problem is. Um, well, one way to do this is kind of a hacky way to do it, but let's, there's probably a better way to do it. But this should be generating. So the, what this should be doing is taking those 45,000 meteorite impact points and showing us, I hope, a plot. Um, I'll tell you what, let's take, um, now this should, this should work fine, but, but um, it, we might, I did this in a rather inefficient way, so, so um, uh, well here, let, let's, let's just for fun, let's just do um, the first thousand of those, um, uh, first thousand for each of these. Uh, well, maybe I'm doing something else wrong here. But um, anyway, what, what I was trying to show you, I think I should live less dangerously and I should actually try running this piece before I actually put it all together with everything else. So let's just do this for the first 10 um, meteorite impacts here. Uh, okay, there we go. And now if I transpose these, I should be getting lat long points. Um, 
Okay, that looks promising. And if I say geo list plot of that, I should be getting something is very wrong there. What am I? Oh, I know what's wrong. Do I know what's wrong? Yes, I think I know what's wrong. What's wrong is that those should have been geo positions. Um, so let's try. Yeah, okay. Well, we can obviously get this plot. I'm, I'm curious uh, whether we can do a little bit more. Well, we could probably do some interesting physics about those meteorite uh, positions. But we could also try doing some completely other API, or I could respond to other kinds of questions. So maybe I could, I'm going to get down and hold them. I mean, I can go on pursuing this, but, but uh, uh, I think we're, we're losing people. That's always a sign that I'm yakking on for too long. So, so um, what should I do? Uh, do you have questions, or should I, would you like to suggest things to do here? Or, or, yes, please. What if you were to plug in something like synesthesia, you were to say, what is the tone to this color, or what is the opposite? What would it do? We can try. I was told, somebody asked me, are you going to need sound? this presentation and I said no I don't think so but it depends what happens so okay um, so I can this may not be too exciting because you may not be able to hear it very well but you know we can certainly do something okay so let's take the color red let's say we've got let's let's get an image of something or other let's get a um, uh, let's say image of Mount Everest I don't know why I'm thinking of that but let's Let's imagine, actually we probably can do, there's okay, there's an image of Mount Everest, and now we can do all sorts of color things with that. We can say, you know, what are the, um, what are the dominant colors in that image? Okay, that wasn't very exciting. We can make a, um, uh, a chromaticity plot, like a 3D chromaticity plot of that image um, here, and um, then we'll get, uh, we'll get this kind, of, uh, this kind of thing here showing us where in, in color space that lies. So now if we wanted to, we could map color space into, uh, well, let's, let's do a 2D chromaticity plot. Um, we can obviously map those positions in color space into something in frequency space. Um, so for example, let's imagine, just for fun, let us take, uh, let's do this. Let, let's get, um, let's, let's take some sounds. All right, so I've got a sound at position, let's, let's do this. Now this may, again, I, you may not be able to hear these, which would be really uh, unfortunate for this, but let's just say I've got a sound note. I'm gonna have a table of, let's say, uh, 20 sound notes. Okay, now I can make a sound out of those. Um, and, uh, and we don't hear anything at all. So I'm sorry, the, the, this isn't gonna be very exciting, but what I was going to do was to take uh, take the positions in the color triangle and map those positions into frequencies of notes, for example, or actually one thing that just occurred to me, I could use this actual thing as a spectrogram, so then I could actually get a, a sound whose timbre is the, um, uh, the, the form of, so if, if, I have a, um, if I have a sound, um, let's, let's, um, it's kind of a clunky thing right now to do this, but I can do this. Uh, let's see. Actually, you know what? I think I've got example data of sound. Now, I probably should get off the subject of sound because we're not going to be able to hear. Great. That is a bad sign. Something about internet connectivity failed. Um, bad sign. Um, and uh, um, that is odd. Okay, there's something, there's something odd about the way this network is configured that isn't allowing it to get to some server of mine. But, but in any case, the, the, um, uh, hopefully that can be resolved if people are using this later. It doesn't look, it doesn't look like a terribly serious problem. But, but um, what I was going to do was to pick up some example sound and start making spectrograms from it as a way to see at least the inverse of the operation that I was imagining doing, which is taking a, a, a positions in the color triangle and turning that into a spectrogram to make a, to make a sound. Other, yes, please. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of we have a lot of the basement power now. The things, what about like restaurant? Yeah, it has some of that stuff. I mean, in, in um, uh, I don't know. We can if we go to, uh, I mean, we can go to the Yelp API or something too. But we can, you know, if we go to Wolfram Alpha, for example, and we can say, you know, ten uh, closest Starbucks to. 
Uh, since it didn't know, actually this, no, this is again not going to know where we are because um, uh, let's say New York City, uh, it's the center of New York City, let's say. Um, So this is, I just said, 10 closest Starbucks to the center of New York City. Let's see whether we can compute that in Wolf Alpha first, and then, um, what's happening here? Okay, so that's a, great. It gave me the polygon for New York City, but it didn't, um, okay, let's do, let's do this. Let us find out um, uh, what we probably want to do. We don't have as, so, our curated data does not, we have a certain amount of data on chain restaurants and things like this. We don't have the depth of data that something like Yelp has. And if you want to use Yelp, the best thing to do is to go to our service connection system and to go here and to look up the documentation because I don't know how to do this and to go list of external services and there's Yelp and go to the page that's documentation for how to get to Yelp and let me make it bigger so you can actually see it. Um, so this is showing how to, this is showing an example of how you would connect to Yelp. Now I think with Yelp, you need to get a password from them. Let's see. Oh, okay, so this is a connector that's running on, against their API, and so you need a password from Yelp to be able to actually do this stuff, and you'd also need this error not to be occurring. But anyway, this is, uh, so this is showing how you would use the Yelp API to, um, okay, um, uh, to, to, to do some computation, and that was that was just putting some particular thing on, on a map. Yeah. Uh, sure. I mean, as I showed, you can build an API to run in our cloud. You can also connect to whatever API you have. So if you have a device, we have a very convenient thing uh, called Wolfram Data Drop, which is a way of connecting, for example, a device to, um, uh, to so datadrop.wolfram.com. So this is uh, basically the idea is get data from a device, accumulate it in the cloud, analyze it. So for example, and you can, you can get the data in from, with, a, with an API, you can tweet to it, you can send mail to it, you can use various kinds of, uh, you know, ift, uh, things like that. Um, now what we can do here, so for example, I could go ahead and I could say um, uh, data, I could look at the personal data bins that are connected to this particular account that I have here. So for example, I've got something like this, Okay, so here's a data bin um, that is based on some sensors that are, are on my desk. So I could say date list plot of the data that's been accumulated from that data bin, and now it will go through and it will plot the, um, well, this was from, I don't know when this is, from February or something. This is the pressure as a function of time uh, as measured by the board that's been sitting next to my computer on my desk at home. And so I could go ahead, actually it would be fun to kind of compare it if I say air pressure data, well, even I could say here for, let's say, now minus, um, let's say, uh, this is not going to be comparable. I'd have to do, so I'd say now minus two weeks to now. So this is now going to give me a time series of air pressure data for, oh, shoot, here was not here, was it? So let's put in something more, more reasonable here. Um, the air pressure data for New York City, um, and uh, so now I get a time series here, I can make a plot of that time series. I could go and I could say, for example, something like I could, instead of getting the, a plot there, I could say what's the, um, uh, what's the mean, um, uh, what's the mean pressure been? Oops, it has various data points that aren't available, which is kind of odd, but so it goes. And I could, you know, work out a histogram of the air pressure as a function of time in New York City and so on. So that's the kind of thing you do. But, but adding your own things, for devices, the state drop is a good mechanism for doing it. You know, the, the language is also bundled on like the Raspberry Pi computer. So if you want to connect something directly to a, you know, you actually have a thing with a voltage and so on, you can uh, plug it into a Raspberry Pi and then have the Raspberry Pi or from engine connect to our cloud, for example, um, to, uh, to connect it into the whole ecosystem. Other, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, so we have actually very complete computational geometry capabilities, and which have just been added, actually, and we are about to get, in another couple of months, we will get even more. But if you, if you do something like, um, uh, you know, you can take something like this, let's say, 
we, we've got all sorts of detailed anatomical data about humans. So there's a, um, there's a femur, and I could go ahead and I can do, well, I could probably do some visualization. I could texture map onto this femur or something if I wanted to, or I could say, you know, what's the area of that thing? It will give me the result. Um, if I want to work out, um, well, actually, if you, you, you didn't see anything in terms of map projections, actually. If you see, um, uh, if you want to know what map projections, um, that's, the, that's the set of map projections that we actually have. Uh, we, we have a really complete set of those kinds of things. And if you want to do, or you want to do a projection, so there's a geometric transform. Let's see, geometric transformation. Let's see what this does. Uh, yes, so this is a way of doing an arbitrary geometric transformation, so shearing transforms, things like that. I think there's a way to do image geometric, what is it? What is it called? I have to, let me look for one thing here. Um, if I look for, um, uh, let's see. I'm going to look. I believe it's image transformation. Okay. Image transformation looks good. Okay, so this is doing on an image, this is doing an arbitrary function transforming the image. So, for example, that first example there is taking the Mona Lisa and transforming it with a square root. Okay, so you can do that, you can map that onto a 3D object. Um, you can kind of, kind of go to town with this type of thing. And I, I think the, the mesh stuff that we have in 3D should allow you to do pretty arbitrary deformations and so on, if, that, if that's what you want to do. You can also take, um, yeah, I mean, lots of different things of this kind. The map projections, many of them have a bunch of fancy math that optimizes being able to, because for map projections, we're interested in taking you know, actual maps of the Earth and so on and taking all the different features on them and quickly being able to project. And so there's some cleverness often involved in the particular way that those actual map projections are implemented. But with an arbitrary function, I don't think it's particular. I mean, if I, if I change that square root, I have no idea. Let's change the, the square root to a, um, uh, a cube root, for example, and let's see what happens. Um, okay, so, and in fact, maybe what we can do, let's just for fun, let's change it to an arbitrary power there. Let's make a manipulate out of this that has a power P ranging from 1 to 10, for example. And let's see what happens to the Mona Lisa in that situation. Let's see what happens here. Okay, so there's the regular Mona Lisa. And now, okay, that's kind of cool. Um, and that's what happens when we've got 10th power or something of it. Um, so, and, and we could do the same thing. I mean, again, I can texture map this onto a 3D object and so on if I wanted to. All right, maybe one last question, but I think we're probably out of time, unfortunately. Yes, please. With what? I'm sorry. I don't know. I mean, Google is primarily a search engine, which is a completely different type of thing. I mean, we, we, are, we are mostly dealing with... Uh, I mean, I don't know, Google is a big company with 100,000 employees, so I'm sure they're doing lots of different things. They're making self-driving cars, and they were making two-legged robots, but they stopped doing that recently. Um, but uh, maybe they've got a three-legged robot somewhere as well. I, I mean, the, the, but the, the primary, you know, their primary uh, objective, I think, is to make a good search engine, and a search engine is really a different kind of thing from from what we're doing. I mean, that's about taking the, whatever it is, you know, 15 billion pages of reasonably interesting content on the web and allowing you to, you know, to rank which things you actually care about um, on the web. And that's something, I mean, actually, uh, you can use some of the things, we've done some things with, uh, that you may see coming out in the next some number of years that address those kinds of issues in an interesting way, but that's a, a different, uh, different kind of thing to what we do. What we, what we have done uh, with both Malfa, which is what powers Siri and S-Voice and stuff like that, what, we, what we've done there is to try and uh, collect and make computable as much sort of structured data as possible about the world. Um, whether it's, you know, I mean, I could take, I don't know, let's, let's take a, a random piece of data. Let's take something like, um, uh, let's do this. Let's say, you know, I mean, if I say something like this, I say, you know, word trans I'm just making up a different thing, but let's say something like um, Earth. Word translation of Earth, you know, translate that into as many languages as possible, whatever, whatever it is, right? So, all kinds of weird things here. Um, but, uh, you know, what we're trying to do is to, is to make uh, a lot of data that is computable and interoperable so that we can actually run it in a language and compute things from it. 
um, that's really quite different from what, um, uh, you know, and when you search the web, what you get back from searching the web is a link. Um, and maybe you can import that link and do things with it. I mean, for example, when I did that web image search, I was using uh, somebody else's, might even have been the Google API, um, to do that search. And what it was doing was bringing back the, you know, a bunch of random images from the web. So it's, a, it, you know, it's, it's not bringing back structured things that you can then compute with. So that's, that's kind of the, and you know, depending on what you're interested in doing, if you're interested in building a lot of stuff on the top of, uh, you know, on the basis of, of data, then you need sort of data that's been made computable. If you're interested in finding some needle in the giant haystack of the web, then you need a search engine. And that's, you know, that's kind of the, 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 the difference of, of approaches there, I think. Yeah. yeah I'm actually curious about the, the types of things you can learn and represent. So, you know, data is contextual and an image. Could I get something like an image and then ask a question, is it, is it cool in this image and someone's wearing a jacket and then be able to understand that this is, this is cool? It's things along that line. Well, so there are different kinds of things. So, so, you know, we have actually coming out in the next couple of months a very, uh, we've been kind of surfing the wave of what's been happening in kind of the machine learning world. And what we have in what exists here is kind of the pretty much absolutely, a little bit beyond state of the art of things that can be done as of about six months ago. Um, what we will have coming out is something that is kind of a, a rather beyond the state of the art of what's sort of supposed to be possible now. Um, what's, what's here now, if you had, for example, you know, if I take a bunch of pictures, I mean, a, a very simple-minded version of this. Let, let, let's just show you how to do some image classification. So let, let's say I've got, I think I had an example here. Let's try this. Let's try, here, here's a good, good trivial example, okay? So let us see, um, so this is a, a training set a tiny training set, right? Where we've got a bunch of images where we say some of them are night and some of them are day, okay? So I'm gonna use that as a training set and I'm gonna say, make a classifier based on, okay, so it just used logistic regression in this case. It's a small training set, it's not gonna do anything terribly exciting. But now I've got a function, day, night, that I can feed any image I want to. So for example, I could feed it, uh, let's pick some image that I had here. Um, well, let's feed, it, let's feed it the image of the otter, for example, here. Um, and let's go ahead and uh, 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 we'll back down here. Um, long way here. Okay, so let's feed it that image of an otter, and it'll probably tell us, okay, it'll tell us it's day, right? So that's a, that's a sort of trivial thing given an existing training set. Um, if you're asking, do we have a, an already trained system that can tell you a story about a picture, um, the answer is uh, that we do not yet have a released such object. The, um, the, but we, we do have, you know, again, we, we have an image identifier that um, uh, will, you know, will tell you for pretty well. Let's see what it thinks that is. That hopefully, what is that? What the heck is that? Um, hmm. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Well, it's, uh, it looks maybe it looks underwater here. It uses it's uh, it's some um, uh, anyway. The, the um, uh, so so the answer is that that uh, w one of the challenges there is how do you represent? I mean, this is a this is a long story. I mean, how you represent things in the world? We have a we have a great way to represent. I mean, if I have something like let's say you know chocolate, for example. Okay, I have a, a, a pretty good way to represent you know foods with chocolate, and I can say something like, um, what could I say? I could say, I don't know, um, let's see if this works. Uh, is that gonna work? No, what is it gonna work? It's gonna work here. Let's see, I could say, um, uh, this may generate a huge long thing, but, um, uh, so you know, I could ask it all kinds of properties of chocolate, but if I want to represent some statement, like, I want a piece of chocolate, that's a different and separate thing, and uh, wait for the future. The, yeah, any other? Anything else? Yeah. I've seen the world grow throughout the years, growing up to you, and I push, I move forward, do much process of machine learning. What's really what's next to the 
Well, I mean, the, you know, the basic thing that's happened is that um, uh, the symbolic language that you know that I originally designed 30 years ago now um, has has turned out to work out really very well as a way to represent all sorts of different kinds of things. And I kind of am almost embarrassed every so often to realize that there's a whole nother giant area that we can represent well in the symbolic language that I hadn't realized we could represent well in the symbolic language. And so we've kind of, at this point, you know, there are many different threads of development, like for example, geometry, you know, will be soon, we're going to have a lot of very nice stuff for uh, uh, doing 3D printing related kinds of things. Um, something which should be easy, but really isn't, is if you have kind of a bunch of polygons and you want to say, I want to make this printable and I want to make sure that all the little pieces have been repaired and so on, that turns out to be a hard problem. That we have finally now, after probably six or seven years of work, we have, we've actually finally solved that problem and we have a really pretty nice way of doing this. Um, and so that's, a, you know, that's been sort of a long-term thread of uh, development. There's a, there's a lot of stuff to do with deployment in different kinds of places, so cloud deployment, is something that we have doing a uh, highly parallel computation we've already got. We, there'll be, uh, you, you can already run Wolfram language in a parallel configuration. You can say, you know, evaluate them. I mean, I could just say something like, you know, parallel uh, table, some, some trivial thing like, you know, dollar process ID or something. And if you watch carefully, this, this computer probably has uh, four cores, so it will start up four kernels and run and distribute that trivial computation across four kernels. Um, we, can, we can do that in, um, uh, so doing that in a network across a thousand kernels is now possible. Um, that will be something that you'll be able to you do directly in our cloud. Um, we will, we're working to make that number a thousand be bigger than a thousand, um, and it will be in due course. Um, the, uh, I mean, there's, there's just a lot of different things happening in kind of, a lot of stuff to do with deployment in both the supercomputer level to the IoT level. Um, that's, that's one sort of dimension. A lot of things to do with algorithmic stuff, uh, whether it's doing more things with natural language processing, um, and uh, we, we've done, you know, we've done a lot with natural language understanding. We've done less with things like, um, uh, you know, if I say something like text structure, uh, um, this is a nice day. Um, this should wake up, wake up, okay. Um, there we go. So that should give the parse tree for that, um, uh, for that sentence, and I could probably say um, uh, dependence, let's see, what do I want to say? I want to say constituent uh, tree here, and now I can get, no, constituent graphs. Um, now I should be able to get, okay, so there's the graph of that. I can pick this up, and uh, if I wanted to, I could do, um, well, let, let's, let, here, let's do something, let's do, Wikipedia data of NASA, so this will get us the, um, uh, oh, come on, okay, that, that's, that's going to get us the, um, uh, the Wikipedia page for NASA, you know, I could, if I wanted to, I could just say something like word cloud that, let's delete the stop words, because it will not be so interesting to see it with the stop words, um, then, uh, so that will, that will just give us this word cloud, okay, great, space is big for NASA, we kind of knew that, um, the, uh, now what I could do is I could say, just for, let's live dangerously here, and let's say, um, let's take this and let's say text structure of, uh, no, let's say um, text sentences um, of that comma three, for example, and that should give me the first three sentences of that thing, and now I could say text structure um, of, uh, let's see, that, and then constituent graph, uh, of that, and so what that should do, okay, there we go, so there's the, um, there are the graphs for those three sentences, and just to, to really live dangerously, let me just for fun, let's see what happens if I do, okay, there we go, there's the, there's the graphs of those things, let's, let's get something like the um, uh, community graphs um, for each of those graphs, so let's see what happens if I do that, uh, let's try this. Um, Am I going to regret this? Oh, there we go. That's kind of fun. Okay, so that's the that's the sort of community graph of the um, uh, of the parse tree of that English sentence. So anyway, they're, they're just a lot of. I mean, it's kind of a funny thing, you know. Our company is a fairly small company, eight hundred 
hundred people, um, and uh, it's, you know, I've been what what I've been doing over the course of years is basically trying to automate as much stuff as possible so that eight hundred people can do a lot of stuff. And it's been kind of a nice experience because we take you know lots of areas where it looks like this is going. Really slowly. Let's see if we can automate what has to be done there. Okay, I should stop. The um, the. Uh, Mid sentence. Well, okay. <laughs> the, um, it, uh, the, oh, okay. The, the, um, the, the, oh, okay. 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 Good. The, there's five. There's five fingers there, right? We could probably even get a nice image, image, uh, um, uh, uh, machine vision thing to count that. But, but you know, the, the the thing that we've been able to do that has been very, you know, first of all, we have a simple private company which has allowed us to kind of actually do long-term projects um, that you know take can take a decade or something to come to fruition and second of all we have sort of been progressively automating more things so that we're able to uh, in remarkably short time produce you know rather impressive and large lumps of software and so that's kind of and the you know the thing for the thing that is now the case is that so this whole Wolfram language stack and the Wolfram cloud is now sort of finally uh, sort of readily exposed to the world. We just released our open cloud about six weeks ago now. Um, and so a lot of people are starting to use it uh, for things from very large, I mean, there are a bunch of very large companies that are doing very large things um, with it to a lot of startups doing things. Um, a lot of companies that have traditionally been low tech that are sort of injecting high tech kinds of things because it finally became easy to do some very fancy piece of visualization and machine learning or something that in the past would have been something that you would have had to hire people for you know several people for many months to do and you can now just get something to do in a short time. So it's kind of a it's an interesting moment in our uh, sort of story because we, you know the things we have are now uh, really accessible and deployable I hope by people just building random hacks and building not so random companies and so on. So, anyway, okay, one, one last thing that we really have to wrap up. Could you, yes, please. Well, I mean, you can obviously store persistently whatever you know, lumps of data you want in our cloud um, in terms of giving it, you know, telling it in natural language, you know, this is the facts about the world and then retrieving those, that, that's not what we do. That's, that's, a, that's a different, different kind of function. All right, I should stop. Thanks a lot.